beginning, I mean, thank you reciprocally, Nick, for much valuable and stimulating discussion. Um, I'm not a photographer myself. I sometimes take a photograph, but when I'm out in the field, I prefer to keep moving and recording. I'm no good at photography. But I, I thought I would try to use my own photographs where I'd got something half decent and I didn't have some of the time. So many thanks to Jessica Bone for allowing me to use the photos taken by herself and her late husband, Jim. I'd also like to thank four people, Peter Eels, Richard Carter, Vince Massimo and Clive Sandell um, at UK Butterflies for their permission to use their photos. Any photos without an attribution are actually my own. Now, are you seeing at the right hand side of your screen um, um, thumbnails of participants? Can, can you see, for example, and under the acknowledgements, Peter Eels, Richard Carter, Vince Massimo, and Clive Sandell. Can you see the E of Clive? No. No. Okay, how can I get rid of these people who are down the side of my screen? <laughs> it depends. It's, it's every, if you go view. Uh, right, yes. How about that? Side by side. So you've got side by side speaker. It's got waiting room with three participants when I click on view. Okay, I'll um, let them I'll let them let in me straight come, away. Let me come out of um, full screen. Right. So uh, down the bottom. Um, because this these thumbnails of people are taking up part of the screen. I think it's controlled by each person on Zoom. So everyone on their top right of their Zoom screen, that view button, if you click on that, you have standard side-by-side -side speak and side-by-side -side gallery. If you click on one of the side-by-side -side options, it should move it so the, the, the thumbnails of people or just the speakers move separate to the... Second. I'm going to click down my presentation then momentarily. Um, right. No. If you start, if you uh, maximize your Zoom uh, uh, application, Terry. Don't worry about it, Terry. Just go for it. Everybody's, okay. everybody's view will be different according to their setup. I just just okay. carry on. Just far right. away. So I'll go to full screen then. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm only going to include species of butterflies that are likely to be seen on typical Yorkshire transects. Um, I'm going to present them roughly in the order that they will first occur as we move through the year. So they're not in any systematic order. It's just that the ones that occur that you might even see at the moment will be the first ones to be considered. But some species do occur more than once during a year. Um, I guess some people in the audience know more about butterfly identification than I do. Um, but one point you need to bear in mind is that we get so used to seeing pretty pictures, pretty photographs of butterflies sitting on a flower. When you're walking along a transect, that you, they don't present themselves like that quite often. They might just fly across just in front of you. So I'm also going to say a bit about habits and habitats of butterflies, which will also aid in identification. <laughs> So the first butterfly usually, or certainly one of the first butterflies in the year is the brimstone. I guess many of us have already seen a brimstone this year. The males are bright yellow. Um, the females are rather more greenish. When they rest, they rest with their rings closed. Okay, so you're seeing the underside of the rings. They they've got this edging, which rather resembles a leaf. Now, the one butterfly you might mistake for a brimstone, or you might think is something different from a brimstone, is a large white. When we come onto the large white, because they can be a bit color, slightly sort of greenish yellowish underneath, but they have a smooth outline to the rings and other features as well. The range of the distribution of the brimstone just about covers Yorkshire going northwards, 
Um, they're limited by buckthorn, either older buckthorn or purging buckthorn. And if you really want to attract the brimstone into your gardens, and who wouldn't, because they're lovely butterflies, just get some buckthorn and then you'll get the brimstones. They wander quite widely and you can get them in pretty urban areas as well as in the countryside. Now, univoltine means one generation a year, one cycle of breeding. Some butterflies have two generations a year, in which case they'll be called bivoltine or even trivoltine if they have three generations a year. So we see the brimstones trice. We see them now. And then once we get into the summer, they will disappear and then they'll reappear again late summer, early autumn. So we see them twice, but what happens to the autumn ones is that they go into hibernation and then they reappear about now, breed, lay their eggs. So there's only one cycle of breeding. In other words, there's only one generation, even though we see them twice per year. Right, so that's the brimstone. The number up here is 65 millimetres is the average ring span. Sometimes females are larger than males, in which case I'll give you both, a separate average for each gender. Um, most places you look tend to give a range of ring span. Well, I think uh, it's most useful really to know what the typical is. So that's what I'm giving you. I'm sure many of us have seen small tortoise shells the last few days as well. A medium sized, um, butterfly, if it gets up to about 60 above, they're large butterflies. If it gets down to about 40 or below, they're what you'd call small butterflies. So this is a medium butterfly, very common, see them all over the place. Um, they're red, well, orangey, black and yellow, but the real characteristic that distinguishes them from other similarly colored butterflies is this these edgings of little blue markings called lunules. There, no other butterfly in this country could be confused in that sort of way. Um, they're emerging now from hibernation. Um, they, they're particularly common around spring, which is where they tend to mate and um, where the females lay their eggs. The males are very territorial. In fact, the other day I saw a, a small butterfly in my garden and, a, and um, a speckled wood came nearby and that small tortoise shell didn't half see it off. It added it into next door's garden in no time at all. Um, the adults breed again. Um, and then their offspring feed up in the autumn for hibernation. hibernation. So whereas the brimstone, we had two flight periods, but we're only one generation. With the small tortoise shell, we get two generations per year. Possibly in some exceptionally good years, there might even be three, but generally two generations per year. The next one is the peacock, which is uh, sometimes confused with small tortoise shell. Uh, small tortoise shells, um, always rest with their rings open. Peacocks can rest with their rings open or closed. They are uh, considerably bigger than the small tortoise shell. Um, that, and when you see them flying, that they, they look large and they look dark, because I'll show you a picture of the underwings in, in the middle in a minute. And those small tortoise shells tend to have a rather more fluttery flight. Peacocks, if they take to the ring, they often shoot off at some speed. Again, they're emerging from hibernation at the moment. Um, they, the females will lay eggs on nettles. The dark larvae uh, start off in communal webs. After a while, they disperse and pupate. And then around about late July, the young will emerge as adults and then they will feed up and go into hibernation. So again, a bit like the brimstone, we have two flight periods, but it's only one generation per year. So there's a peacock at rest with its wings closed. Let's just see how dark it is underneath. And just think how well camouflaged that would be on the tree trunk. Also, uh, appearing from hibernation about now um, is the comma. Um, this is normally only seen in ones or twos at this time of year. In the autumn, they can congregate in orchards um, after fallen fruit, but 
generally speaking, you just see them in one or two this, this time of year. Unmistakable, these very, very ragged ring edges to, to the rings, no other butterfly is like that. Um, they have a very complicated life history, which I won't go into now because it's not really relevant uh, to transect walking. But there are there's two types of comma genetically distinct, um, one of which goes through one cycle of breeding per year, and the other goes from two cycles of breeding per year. So when they hibernate in the autumn, uh, these two different types uh, have been have been through different cycles different numbers of cycles of breeding over the course of the summer. It's complicated. So that's the comma. There's a comma uh, with its wings closed. So now you can see the comma mark there. That's why it's called a comma. And notice it's on an egg carton and that's because it came to my light trap during the night. And quite a lot of butterflies fly during the night. If you ask many people, what's the difference between a butterfly and a moth? They'll say butterflies fly in the daytime, moths fly at night time. Well, it's not true. Lots of moths fly during the night, during the daytime. And butterflies tend, some of them, to fly also during the night time when they come to light traps. Uh, next is the speckled wood, which is also just on the, coming onto the wing now. Um, go back 30 or so years ago, you wouldn't have seen any speckled woods in Yorkshire. They have spread northwards massively over the last 30 years. It's called the speckled wood. It's a butterfly of woodland, but it comes into gardens. You see it in, uh, in decent hedgerows. One of the nice features of the speckled wood is that the males uh, set up territories on a sunspot, say on the floor of the wood. Now, as the sun uh, moves through the sky, the sunspot will move across the floor of the wood and the male's territory will move with the sunspot. And if another territory comes and invades, if another uh, speckled wood comes and invades the territory of one that's there already, they have this quite uh, aggressive spiraling flight up into the air and one of them eventually will fly off and the other one will come back down to the ground. And by marking them it's been shown that the one that returns to the sunspot is usually the one that was there first, um, whereas the, the one that tries the interloper normally leaves and perhaps looks for uh, another sunspot. Uh, this speckled wood, three broods throughout the year, there's not much time when you can't see speckled woods. Now Although, as I say, I'm going through in sequence of appearance rather than um, in family groups. But in actual fact, there's the family groups, they often, the different species often do emerge at similar times of year. So I'm going to deal now with three large whites, sorry, three species of white, large white, small white, and green veined white, all of which start to appear around about now. Um, the large white is very common. It's the major press, pest of brassicas. Um, now, they have spots on their wings, and the exact details of these spots vary between three species. Um, they vary between males and females, and also whether you're talking about spring brood and the second brood in the summer. So let's not worry about the spots. I'm going to concentrate on the features that make it easy to tell the difference between these three species. The large white it is large and it has very extensive black at the um, tip of the forewing. Um, it's unmistakable for that reason. The underside is in fresh ones in particular, uh, yellowish or green, slightly greeny yellowish, but concentrate on this size, this substantial black patch at the ring apex. Um, the other thing um, I said is that large whites, when they fly, they're normally seen where they're going and they're jolly well going to go, go there. They, they have strong flight and fly with attitude. Um, there's Quite a bit of large rights immigrate into the country from the continent. In fact, I remember back in 1969, standing on the banks of the River Elbe in North Germany, and 
there were so many large whites migrating out into the North Sea, it was almost as if you were in a snowstorm. Two generations, as I've mentioned, the spring generation coming out now, and then a larger brood later in the year. The, the larvae of the large white are gregarious, they're, they're the ones that attack your cabbages. Small white is smaller, as the name implies, um, but the difference in size is not totally diagnostic, particularly when they take off. Um, now, the small white has a very much smaller smudge of pigmentation at the apex of the ring. Um, they do not fly in such a dramatic straight line fashion as if they know where they're going, as is the case for the large white. They're rather more fluttery in their uh, flight pattern. Um, they're on the ring more or less the same time of the year, the two generations, as is the case for the large white. The larvae are solitary though, they, 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 they don't occur in groups. Um, as is the case with the large white. And the small white, yes, it can be a bit of a garden pest, but they also lay eggs on quite a wide range of uh, wild cruciferae. Now, the green veined white, um, on my screen, I've got um, various sorts of Zoom stuff um, interfering, uh, but uh, that may be the case for you. I don't think there's anything to do with it. Do about it, but this is the green veined white. Um, they're about 50 millimeters, but I find they're quite variable in size, and sometimes they can be surprisingly large up towards uh, the large white size. Now, these are not a pest, they feed uh, on quite a wide range of wild crucifers. Um, they are notably feeble in their flight, they're sort of fluttering around in an aimless sort of fashion. Um, near their food plants. They're very widespread. Um, they tend to occur in damp habitats and they can go right up to quite high altitudes. You can sometimes find them at the tops of, of the mountains. Now they don't, they have less, um, they don't have a dark patch of pigmentation like the large white does, and they don't have a much smaller, whoops, sorry, um, patch like the small white that does, they have this sort of rather feeble um, smudgy area drifting down the ring a little bit like that. Uh, but the really distinctive feature of the green veined white, and this is why it's called the green veined white, is that on the underside the veins have this darker greener pigmentation running along the veins. So you've got the combination of the fluttery flight um, the smudgy effect on the top of the rings at the apex and this uh, pigmentation, greenish pigmentation running along the veins. Something that I find, and I don't know whether other people would, is that if I half close my eyes and squint, a green veined white, you can sort of get, pick. I can pick up the sort of flickering of this pigmentation actually coming through in flight, which you don't get with small white. Now, when we come on to talk about transect methodology in the second talk, UK BMS recommend that if there's lots of whites and you're finding them difficult to identify as you do your transect, then what you do is you just count the number of whites. And after you've finished, you, you go with your net or what have you, you chase them down and you see what they are and, and say you might have seen a hundred whites on the transect and you go and chase down let's say 10 and you find you've got two green veined whites, three small whites and five large whites, well then you split your hundred up in that ratio. Now I do not think that is actually a very good idea because the habitats will be different in different sections of the transect, and you may have different ratios of the three whites on different parts of your transect. So are you gonna go back and resample them in every one of the transects on your walk? Well, probably not. Now, what I'd like to recommend, and it's worked for me, I know it's worked for other people, is that you practice with the whites. You can see them in your garden. If you see a right, say to yourself, I think that's a large right, and I'm gonna jolly well, if I can, find out if, I'm right or not. Of course, if it flies over the hedge into next door's garden, it doesn't matter. You weren't able to confirm it. But of the ones that you 
can confirm, that will gradually reinforce your ability to identify them on in flight or from the features that I've told you about. I reckon I'm about 90% correct. And I think if you can get up to 90% correct, you're probably doing better than the method that is suggested by butterfly conservation. This is also a member of the white family, the orange tip. They'll be appearing perhaps in a couple of weeks. The male stands out because of this lovely bright patch on the top of the rings. Um, I can remember very little from my childhood, but I could take you to the exact spot by a little stream in Raworth in the Derbyshire Peak, where I saw my first male orange tip and it had such an impression on me, I've never forgotten that moment, even though it was about 70 years ago. The female doesn't have the orange tip, but they both have this black spot on the top and quite a, a smudge at the ring apex. But they generally, the, the rings are a slightly different shape from the other three whites. Now, they'll occur where, in Yorkshire, wherever their food plants occur which is um, wild cruciferary, like lady smock and garlic mustard. If you have honesty, well, many of us have garlic mustard under the hedges in the garden, but if you have honesty in the garden, they will lay their, their eggs on honesty. The males are very territorial, and you can sit in the ice in the garden and they come backwards and forwards. The females are more secretive. Um, they both have... Um, a sort of mottled pattern under the rings. Both male and female look like that. And so if you've got one at rest, the female is quite distinct from the green veined right, because both the male and female uh, orange tip have this green mottling. That one, incidentally, has just laid an egg there, which I didn't realise when I took the photograph. Right, um, green hair streaks aren't out yet, um, but they will be before too long if the weather's good. This in Yorkshire is mainly an upland species, North York Moors and the Pennines, both the millstone grit and the limestone areas. It's pretty rare in Yorkshire um, on, in, in the lowlands, but it does occur on Heathland and the best place to see it is Strensel Common if you want to see it on, in the lowlands. Now it's unmistakable because of the bright green colour, but this bright green, green colour is only on the underside of the rings and it normally rests with the rings closed so you see it. I've put this other photograph in as well because the rings aren't quite closed and you can just see the brown of the upper side of the rings. Um, it's quite hard to detect in flight, but because they always rest uh, with the rings closed, then if you can get a hunting image for the bright green, you, you will see them. The trouble is that they're sometimes pretty well camouflaged against the vegetation. Um, the main food plants in Yorkshire are bilberry on the moorlands and mainly gorse on the lowland heaths. There's only one generation a year from about the middle of April to um, end of May, early June, one or two lasting to mid-June. For me, it's always that I feel it's a shame when there's no more green hair streaks to try to hunt down. Now, I'm going to be talking to you about two blue butterflies. Um, first, and they're quite, they're quite different. Uh, first, the, first, there's many other species of blue butterflies in the UK, but in Yorkshire, there's just two that are at all common. The small blue occurs in some places. But this is the holly blue, which has this sort of slightly sort of milky violet type of blue. The females have this dark edge to the top of the rings, the males don't. Underside, both males and females just have a simple uh, range of dots, dark dots. Now, these are not colonial, you normally only see them in ones or twos, and you don't normally see them near the ground. They're normally up flying around hedges, bushes, or the lower part of trees. Um, the, the, um, the, uh, the ones that are going to appear before too long, uh, the females will lay their eggs on holly, so you'll tend to see them around holly bushes. 
The offspring um, of those emerge uh, by the height of the summer, and they then tend to hang around ivy. So the first generation lays eggs on uh, holly, second generation lays eggs on ivy. And in actual fact, they can go quite well into towns, uh, particularly towns with old buildings and so on, where you've got ivy on the walls, you'll see the holly bloom. It varies in abundance massively uh, over years. It has a sort of fairly regular cycle up and down, um, which some have attributed to the fact that there's a species of a small parasitic wasp uh, for which the holly blue is the only host. So when there's lots of um, holly blues, the parasite does well and therefore it forces down the number of the holly blues, therefore the parasite doesn't do well and therefore they're in this cycle, the parasite following the butterfly. So that's the holly blue. Um, Totally different type of uh, butterfly is the dingy skipper, uh, which is pretty local, uh, although um, the, some colonies are quite large in the right sorts of habitats, and you do get the odd one wandering around. They like open ground, which is warm and has bare patches, and with some bird's foot trefoil, that's Lotus corniculatus. Its behaviour is rather different from other butterflies, and it, 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 it's a, it you can be confused by it because it tends to visit flowers and then it suddenly darts off into another flower and so on. Sometimes it'll settle onto the ground and bask with its wings open like here. But they, they, they can look a little bit more like a rather dull moth flying around than a butterfly. They will be appearing in about um, a month or so, month to six weeks, only one generation per year, although uh, there is some evidence in good years of a, perhaps a very, very small second generation. This is the second blue, the common blue. Uh, the males um, have bright um, um, violet blue, uh, almost metallically uh, blue on the upper surface of the wings. Uh, the females, though, are brownish and indeed can be very brown but often there's a bit of blue adjacent to the abdomen. And if you see that, you know you've got a, a female common blue. Um, they form colonies, remember the holly blue didn't, uh, particularly in areas where birds foot trefoil occurs, that's Lotus colliculatus, um, widespread um, rough areas, grasslands, um, brownfield sites, so long as there's birds foot trefoil there. Um, two generations a year um, uh, in the lowlands, um, further north, I don't know whether this is the case in north, right at the northern edge of Yorkshire, but certainly as you go to higher altitudes, there tends to be only one generation per year from June to September. Um, now then, um, a close relative of the common blue is the brown argus, and I guess most many of you will have heard the talk that Martin Partridge gave a few weeks ago. Um, originally, um, the brown argus um, didn't occur in Yorkshire. Uh, it occurred just south of Yorkshire, um, the caterpillars feeding on rock rows. Um, in the 1990s, it suddenly spread northwards into Yorkshire, and the the, the brown argus has started laying eggs on geranium. Um, and instead of having one generation a year, it's having two, possibly three generations a year, and it moved fairly rapidly northwards, possibly assisted by set aside and these weedy geraniums growing on set aside. Now, the males and females are similar, they're this rich um, dark brown colour. Um, now, we've got a, sometimes a slight problem. Remember, the female common blue sometimes uh, can be a rich dark brown on its upper surface without any hint of blue. So there's a problem. How do you tell the difference between a female a common blue of that type and a brown argus? Well, if you look on the underside of the forewing of a brown argus, there isn't a spot there where there is one in the common blue. 
And also there's a couple of spots that occurred there that looked like a, an hourglass or a colon. Another complication is there's another species called the northern brown argus, which is indistinguishable from the brown argus, except where they occur. Uh, up in the dales of Yorkshire, you get the northern brown argus south um, and south and um, eastwards of the dales and on the lower ground, you get the brown argus. The brown argus is, is spreading, so I suppose you get to higher dales and then there'll be a problem. But there's, there's no reliable way at the moment of telling the difference between brown argus and northern brown argus other than where you've seen them. Now, just to emphasize this problem about telling the difference between a brown argus and a female uh, common blue, this one you'd be all right with because it's got some blue on the top of the rings. But in the absence of the blue, then you can look under the rings and the common blue has this spot there underneath the forewing that's more than halfway towards the body where it's completely absent in the brown argus. That is diagnostic. The other one on the hind wing, which I find much more difficult, is that that spot occurs adjacent to that one in the brown argus, so you get this colon effect. Here now are a couple of photos from Three Hags Wood Meadow, which is between uh, York and Selby, taken by Jessica and Jim Bone. Uh, here we have a brown argus, no spot there, and you've got the hourglass there, or the colon. On the common blue, you can just see the spot there, and uh, those two spots on the hind wing are well separated. Okay, so there's a bit of a tricky situation there. Um, now, the small copper, it's very small. It's really one of my very favorite butterflies because despite being small, there's a lot of beauty packed into this small butterfly. Um, it's pretty common. Um, it uh, tends to occur in smallish colonies um, where the food plant, which is sorrel, occasionally docks, uh, grows. It's pretty common on brownfield sites, but it is well distributed around. It's less frequent than it used to be, thought because of the intensification of agriculture. It's uh, an active little butterfly, particularly in sunshine. It flies fast, but it doesn't normally fly far and it'll settle down on the ground with its wings open and it's unmistakable. Um, usually three generations per year. In fact, um, 2019 was an unusual year in that the autumn generation was very, very strong. There were more copper blues then than earlier in the year at most sites, I think. Right, uh, the wall brown is interesting. It has greatly declined in recent years, starting off in the Midlands and the South. That's where the decline started. And that decline has moved northwards and hit Yorkshire uh, in the early 2000s. Um, now, you're really only likely to find it easily um, on higher ground or in coastal regions. It's a shame because it's a really lovely butterfly. Um, I want to emphasize that it's got a spot there with, with a, an eye spot with a white pupil in it because some people, if they're not careful, will think they've seen a fritillary and fritillaries don't have an eye spot like that. Um, it occurs in rough grassland, particularly where there's bare batches, sorry, bare patches where it likes to rest and bask in the sunshine. Um, we used to get it um, in my garden. Last, last, it disappeared in 2006. I think I've only seen two in the garden since then. Um, it was lovely because you could sit in the garden, and the males would patrol their territory, and you could sit there and they'd pass you, you know, and five minutes later, they'd be passing you again. And I, I greatly miss the, the wall brown. And then in those days, if you walked along any of the road verges in my area, just north of York, the males would come and greet you as you walked into their territories. Well, it wasn't, it felt as if they were greeting you anyhow, but they just fly backwards and forwards, uh, protecting their territory. So it's a great shame that uh, they are less common than they used to be. Um, right, let's move on now to the small heath. 
Um, this is another of the brown butterflies. It's the smallest, it's the only small brown butterfly we have in this country. It um, always rests with its wings closed, showing again a nice spot there with one white pupil in it. And it also has this squiggly sort of white patch running down the underside of the hind wing that always sits with wings closed. Um, it looks sort of slightly browny orange in flight. It normally has a fairly weak flight and it often lands on the ground just in front of you. And if you see one, there's probably another one lurking nearby. Um, sometimes they can be quite numerous um, uh, on the sort of that some on, on the edge of the North York Moors and on the lowland commons and the heathlands. Um, but it is declining. So if you have small heath on your transect, then that is valuable. Now, I'm sure we all know the Red Admiral. It's a, a large butterfly with very striking coloration. It's a migrant. It can't survive our typical winter. I suppose one or two probably can manage to survive our warmer winters. Um, it's easy to identify, fly, easily identified even when in flight. Big, vigorous flyer. You can see the colours flashing as it flies. It tends to arrive um, the latter part of spring. Um, lays eggs on nettles. The new generation of adults will appear in the late summer and that's when it will be most numerous um, and will be attracting obvious buddler is the sort of place you expect to see them and also they come and feed on uh, fallen fruit in, in orchards. For such a, a striking butterfly that everybody knows about and you see it on, in children's books and on cups, it's a very well-known butterfly, while the little is known about its habits, it's thought, for example, that they may mate at night time in trees and they certainly do come into light traps during the night. Um, the Painted Lady um, is not at all like the Red Admiral, but sometimes people are a bit unsure which they've got. It doesn't have the black, the red and the right, but it's still a very strongly marked and colourful large uh, butterfly. This is a, um, a migrant uh, coming in, uh, uh, across uh, from Africa and Asia. And some years we get loads of them, whereas in most years we perhaps only find one or two. They tend to arrive uh, uh, in the spring, in a, if it's going to be painted lady year. And the thing about the painted lady is that they breed very, very rapidly. It only takes four to six generations from laying the egg to having the adult appear. So in a good summer, they can get through three generations and the numbers will really build up. It basks with its wings open, either taking nectar on flowers or often on the ground on bare patches and is unmistakable. And if you know we've got a painted lady, uh, they're all over the place and they, they migrate with a very, very fast determined flight. In fact, they will fly fast around buildings almost as if they can see where they're going. It, it's uh, uh, amazing, really. The, now, I said I'd mention a fritillary. We have four fritillaries in Yorkshire. Um, the pearl border, the small pearl border, the silver washed and the dark green fertility. I'm, I'm only going to deal with the dark green fertility. If you're working on a transect with one or more of the other three, you'll know about it. But the dark green fertility is the most widespread of our fertilities. Uh, it occurs on the uplands, those are the main areas, but it is spreading. Uh, you get wanderers occurring quite widely, except in VC61, where it does seem to be extremely rare. Um, it's now appearing uh, in good numbers down the magnesian limestone strip. So, for example, if you go to Brockerdale, you'll see good numbers of dark green fertilities there. Uh, its habitats are, are quite wide, calcareous grassland, bracken moorland or woodland clearings. It's not too fussy, but it does need violets. Um, for a colony to be established. You have a rapid flight. Now look, no eye spot. So there's eye spot there. You, it's not a fertility, it's probably a wall brown. Um, the, when it rests, the underside is very characteristic. You have these silvery patches on a darkish green background, hence the dark green fertility. Um, the marbled white, this is actually a member of 
the Brown family, you might think it's along with Large White and so on, a member of the Whites, but it isn't, it's a Brown. Um, the, it's typically, or was until recently, typically a butterfly of the South Midlands and Southern areas of England uh, in rough, uh, particularly ungrazed grassland. In Yorkshire, um, there was a very small number of significant colonies um, up on the Yorkshire Rolls, places like uh, Roram Quarry, for example. And over the last 35 years or so, there has been a spread outwards uh, into the rest of Yorkshire from those focal points in the Yorkshire Rolls. No doubt, and I don't think there's any doubt about this, assisted uh, by human beings on, in, in some cases, but I think it's done quite a lot of it under its own steam. Um, so it's well distributed now in VC 61 and 62, and again on the magnesium limestone strip. And again, if you want to see marbled white, you can go to Rockerdale um, and plenty of other places as well. You, you, can't, you can't mistake the marbled white for anything else, even when it's in flight. An amazing thing about the marbled white is that if it's dull, you won't see them. And then the sun comes out, and if you're in marbled white territory, suddenly they'll be there flying around. It has a fairly short flight period from late June to um, beginning of August. Now, uh, we have, we've already seen the dingy skipper. There's two other skippers that occur in Yorkshire, the large skipper and the small skipper. Um, the large skipper occurs in discrete colonies in grassy habitats, the caterpillars um, feed on grass. Uh, with the large skipper, males pick um, a, a perch and from there they will molest uh, passing females to, to mate with them. Now the thing about these skippers is that when they are at rest, the four rings are held in this diagonal attitude and the hind rings are visible sticking out in the horizontal plane and that's true of both large and small skippers. Um, the characteristic features of the large skipper are the yellowish patches on the rings. If it's a male there's also a whoopsie daisy, um, there's a um, a, a male sex brand, quite a, a notable brown band in about that sort of region. But if you've got a large skipper, the thing you see is the yellow patches and on the underside of the rings, it's sort of slightly greenish yellowish. And again, you've got yellowish patches showing. The other thing, if you get uh, close up to a large skipper, is that the antennae are pointed. I'll give you a blow up now of that photo. And can you see a point, a little point there on the antennae? So that's large skipper. They fly before the small skipper, or at least they start flying before the small skipper. There is a period when the two overlap and then it can be quite, you've got to be careful which one you're dealing with when you see one on a transect. So here we have next small skipper. Um, here the males don't perch and ambush, they actually patrol territories. Um, but, but they rest with the rings half open, just as the large skipper does. And now you have a plain brown surface of the fore ring without the, uh, the yellow patches that you have with the large skipper. If you've got a male, you'll have a thin brown sex brand on the fore ring. The antennae don't have pointed tips. So first of all, the large skipper, then after a while, the small skipper will emerge. The two will be flying together for a while, and then you'll find probably there aren't any more large skippers to see, and there's a few small skippers still hanging on. There is another complication, and that is, uh, there's a, a skipper called the Essex skipper, which is now moving northwards in Yorkshire, it's quite well established in the southern areas of VC61 and VC63. And the only real way to tell the difference between a small skipper and an Essex skipper is to, to get up close and look underneath the antennae where there is a patch of jet black just on the underside 
of the antennae if you've got an Essex skipper. It's almost as if it's been painted with black Indian ink. Um, so that's a bit tricky. And, you, and if you're going to try and photograph one, um, you need to be head on as well to really to get that characteristic. Now, um, when you're on a transect and you know you've got both Essex skippers and small skippers, you can try if they're, if they're small in number, if possible, to determine which are small and which are Essex. But if you've got large numbers of them, and you've probably got large numbers of large flying as well during that in intermediate period, it's a bit of a tall order. So you'll find on the score sheets for transects, there is large skipper, there is small skipper, and then there is small slash as Essex skipper, and there's also small slash Essex skipper. So if you don't want to tell the difference between small and Essex, you can just roll them all into one. Right. Um, now we're well on into um, summer now. Uh, the ringlet, uh, again, has spread greatly up through Yorkshire until recently. It was absent from Lancashire, but I think it now is fell well spread through Lancashire. Um, it's unmistakable. It's got the, it's called ringlet because of these little rings on, 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 the, on the rings. Sorry, I have a speech thing about <laughs> W's and R's. It has rings on its rings. Uh, it also has this right edging to the rings, um, which, which helps distinguish it from the next species I'm going to show to you, the meadow brown. But unfortunately, this right edging tends to get worn as the ringlets have been hanging around. Um, so it's diagnostic with the early ones. It can be more difficult once they've been hanging around for a while. Now, the thing about the ringlet is that it occurs in damp, grassy habitats along stream sides, um, a, a, a boggy land and so on. Um, a feature of the ringlet is that it will fly into the evening after it's gone cool longer than other butterflies do and it will also fly when it's raining. I've seen them at Ashby Pasture on a, at a YNU meeting when it was absolutely pouring down with rain but there were ringlets in flight. So that's the ringlet. It doesn't have a very long flight period. It appears about late June and it's usually well gone by August. Just one or two hanging on a bit tatty by then. Now the meadow brown is probably our most numerous butterfly in this country. Very common, very widespread uh, in all sorts of grassland. I'm going to show you another species eventually, the gatekeeper, which is smaller. Um, the other characteristic is that the meadow brown has one white pupil in its eye spot, whereas the gatekeeper, when we see that, you'll see it's got two. The male meadow brown is a fairly dullish brown butterfly. The female is larger and it has patches of orange in this sort of area, which can actually be quite bright and quite extensive. It's a very common, um, it, um, it is a very common butterfly, very typical of the height of summer. But if you're on a transect where you've got lots of meadow browns and you've got lots of ringlets, it can be quite tricky, particularly when the ringlets have been around for a while, in telling when you've got a meadow brown or a ringlet. But you improve, improve, of course, with practice. Here's the gatekeeper. It's also called the hedge brown. It's a lovely little butterfly. Um, it's got this gorgeous sort of um, orangey um, coloration with a sort of nice plain chocolatey brown around the edge and in the males it's got this brown sex brand got this eye spot at the ring apex and if you look you can see there's uh, two little white pupils in the eye spot now I have heard people claim they've seen um, a gatekeeper with only one white pupil well I don't disbelieve them because it's actually a fairly obvious little butterfly um, but I think two two white spots in the pupil is diagnostic virtually all the time. Um, forms discrete colonies. Um, it came up into Yorkshire uh, during the 1990s, 
Um, now, in my area of Yorkshire, that's uh, VC62, mid VC62, it occurs in good numbers in the Strensel Common area, but not at all very much north of there. And because we've got good colonies in um, World's End and Strensel Common, that's the reason why we, one of the reasons why we've got a transect on that site, because eventually, um, climate change might allow the gatekeeper to start moving upwards onto the slightly higher ground northwards as you move on to the Hambleton Hills. It's got a very short flight period, it appears towards the end of July and it's all over um, by August, by middle August. Okay, I think that's probably the last one. Yes, indeed it is. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Thank you very much, Terry. That was a little bit over 45 minutes. We were a few minutes over, but yeah. uh, if we just pause now uh, and just take a short break, I haven't got any questions in the chat. Um, so I think we're free to take a short break. And uh, let's meet back in approximately three minutes, which is dead on 8.30. And we'll start again. Okay. Uh, Nick, um, is my screen being obscured by Zoom clutter at the top? Is my screen being obscured by Zoom clutter? Uh, it just says at the moment, end of slideshow, click to exit. Yeah. I mean, when, when I was actually doing that last talk, could you see the tops of the uh, screen? Yes, we could. Everything was perfect. But the but if on I guess on some the um, thumbnail pictures of people down the right hand side might have just been slightly. Oh, well, they'd been all right, wouldn't it? Because it was just pictures of of uh, butterflies on the right hand side. So zoom, it was okay. The pictures on the right hand side, Terry, are determined by the viewer. So what you see is determined by what you have in the view selection, which is a little. Uh, uh, a menu appears if you just hover your mouse in the very top right view, you can determine what you actually see. So that's determined by the viewer, not by uh, the presenter. Okay, Terry. I'd like you to start the second half, which is 
all about UKBMS. Okay. Um, towards the end of this talk, uh, I'm going to dem I'm going to go live onto the internet and demonstrate to you the brand new website of the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme. It's only started to appear last week after I'd already started writing this talk and suddenly had to change it uh, substantially. So when I get to that point, um, I'm sort of grasping my courage in both hands and fingers crossed everything will be okay. Now the Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, as it was originally called, just BMS, started in 1976. There's a fairly small number of transects and they were mainly on nature reserves in the southeast of England. Um, so that really wasn't telling you a great deal about butterflies in general in, in the UK, in, in all sorts of areas. Uh, but lots of people um, started, butterfly enthusiasts thought, oh, this transect methodology is good. I'm going to set up my own transect. It wasn't part of the monitoring scheme, but nevertheless, people started using it. So in 2006, Butterfly Conservation uh, launched the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme um, to, to extend the BMS to include transects and surveys in all sorts of habitats uh, across the wider countryside. And now there's, I believe there's more than 1700 fixed root transects um, in operation. They are often called Pollard walks after Ernie Pollard, who invented the methodology. He worked at ITE Monkswood, which was a research station near Huntingdon. And it was in Woodland called Monk's Wood. And um, Ernie uh, developed the transect there. He was interested in the butterflies in the woodland, particularly in the Black Hair Street. It was the classic site for that butterfly. Uh, so even if you're already a transect walker, you'll probably be interested to see what the new website looks like. Now I am going to be concentrating on the standard fixed route transect but there are other types of monitoring that occur in the UK BMS. There's the wider Countryside Butterfly Survey um, transects, which use the same method of walking and recording, but, it's, but, you, but these are set up in pre-allocated one kilometre grid squares. So if you're doing one of these, you say, I live so-and-so, is there a one km grid square allocated for WCBS that I could do? and off you go. And it, the transect is just um, two parallel 1km transects and they are only visited twice or four times to four times in the course of the summer. Uh, there's, um, there we have a special rare species in an area, um, then there are transects that focus just on that species um, at the time of the year when that species is in flight. They're called reduced effort surveys. And there's other things like egg counting, like for the white letter hair streak and larval web counts and so on. Now, although these things are called surveys, the important thing is that the same methodology is used in each year. So they are replicated exactly in a statistical sense. And therefore, really, they are monitoring rather than surveys. And much of this second talk is going to be focusing on the rules, if you like, that have to be obeyed so that walking a transect is a proper statistically viable repeated activity in different years so that the results can be compared with a good degree of accuracy. Now I'm going to cover the following aspects. First of all, how about planning a new transect? That might be the case for some of you. It certainly isn't the case for many of you. How and when do you actually walk a transect? What are the necessary minimum weather conditions? And how do you go about uh, collecting your data? And how do you submit your data to the scheme? And as we'll see, in order to do the last one of these submission of data, your transect is going to be is going to need to be registered registered by butterfly conservation as part of the UK BMS system and you're going to be able to log into it in, in order to submit your data. Right, uh, 
so planning a transect. Um, so if you're setting up a new transect, I would strongly recommend that you get in touch with uh, Nick, Nick Hall, who's our Yorkshire UK BMS transect coordinator. Um, and uh, he will be able to assist you because there's quite a few things that you need to pay attention to. Uh, one of the things you need to be able to identify is why on earth you want to have a, a new transect in that area. What are your motivations for it? Um, you need to consider what range of habitats is available and how they're managed. That might determine the particular route you take in the area. In choosing a route, it obviously needs to be stable over time because it's a monitoring scheme. So we hope that this transect will be able to be a good number of years into the future. So if this patch of land is part of the local plan for housing development or something like that, you don't want to touch it, do you? Um, have a look at the Ordnance Survey map. What sorts of public rights of ways, footpaths or bridle ways are there? Is it open access land? Or is the land, so, at least some of it, in private ownership? In which case you're going to have to get permission to walk across the land. And that opens various sorts of issues, including data protection and so on. Now, um, they recommend that the route is best if it's one to two kilometers long, requiring about one to two, two hours to walk. Now, in the UK BMS website that's just been reworked, uh, there was different bits of similar information in different places. And in one place, it said it, the route was best if it was two to four kilometers long. Now I can't find that. It just says one to two kilometers. Now, that's actually on the shortish side, I think, for many transects. And I, I would not worry at all if you're going to go into the sort of like three kilometer sort of region. But if you're getting, I wouldn't, if you're getting a bit bigger than that, say over four kilometers, it's probably getting a bit too long, particularly if it's challenging ground. You then divide the route into, you're recommended to do it into five to 15 sections, reflecting changes in habitat or management and of roughly equal length. Now I've put that in inverted commas because the first criterion is reflecting changes in habitat and management, but it's very difficult then to get them of roughly equal length. And I know certainly for the two transects that I've been involved in, they're nowhere near roughly equal length. Um, if time allows, like if you decide later on this year that you'd like to have a transect in this area starting next year, well then don't waste time, get out there, ground truth it, try to make sure you're picking the best route uh, for habitats, for your convenience, in words, you don't want it flooding after rain, and also for to get a good feel for the available butterflies. In the absence of being able to ground truth before you start in earnest, the first year of actual transect walking can be a bit of a learning year. And sometimes people do decide that they want to treat the route for the second year onwards. And I strongly recommend that you write a very deep, well, usually a detailed description of the route. And I'll show you an example in just a moment. So here's an example. This is Three Hacks Wood Meadow between York and Selby. Um, this um, transect was first walked in 2019. Um, this field was a barley field, but in 2012 the, um, it was uh, cleared and, um, and re-sown to as a, an example of wood meadow. Now wood meadow is a habitat that we do not really have in this country, but it's common in the Balkan countries, places like Latvia and Estonia. And what you have are coppices of trees and between which you have wildflower meadows. So you have two different types of habitat coming together in a way which should make it really rich for biodiversity. The nearest we have in this country is what we call wood pasture, a woodland with areas within it for grazing. And we only have two reasonable examples of that in Yorkshire. Um, so 2012, it, it was uh, uh, the, it, the 
um, trees started to be planted in. The darker green areas are, are the, the copses of woodland trees or orchard trees and different types of flower meadows were sown in different areas of the field according to the extent to which it was going to be dry pasture or wetter type pasture. Um, so this is the transect, um, it's divided up into uh, nine sections, five of which are in the wood meadow itself, and then there's some well-established um, broadleaf woodland with scrubby understory along the edge of an arable field, along the edge of a hay meadow, and then in mixed, mature mixed uh, woodland and back to, whoops, back to the start. Um, so here we are, nine sections. The idea is that over time there may be interesting contrasts emerging um, between, as far as butterflies are concerned, what's happening within the wood meadow compared with the contrasting habitats around the edge of it, or indeed these contrasting habitats might benefit from having the wood meadow and may show an increase in butterfly species typical of those habitats um, beyond what's generally being found uh, elsewhere in Yorkshire. So we'll have to wait and see. Um, so about half of it is wood meadow, about half of it is the other habitats. Now here, it's critically important because of the mosaic of planting to follow the transect exactly. And there's quite a variety of little uh, footpaths, major or minor, through the different plantings. So when I um, set this up, I wrote this detailed description. Um, I didn't want to be walking myself because I live on the other side of York and already have a transect of the strengths of common. So I put on Facebook just before the start of the 2019 season, help, can anybody walk a transect between York and Selby? And Nick immediately came forward. I just did Chris Abbott and um, Meg Abu Hamdan and I was greatly believed actually because I didn't want to be travelling back and forth between Strensel and Three Hags of Wood Meadow. But because of the nature of the transect, it's necessary to know over the future years, possibly with different people starting to walk it, exactly where the route is. In a woodland where you're just following the main forestry tracks or something, you wouldn't need anything like this level of detail. The bold things are 10 meters square grid references from a GPS and in a habitat of that type, although butterflies are fairly mobile, you really do need to work to that sort of level of accuracy. Right, um, I've got the top uh, <laughs> uh, obscured on my screen, it might just be with other people as well, so I'll just come out. You, How and when to walk a transect? Okay, so let's go back into full screen. So you walk a transect once per week. Week one starts the 1st of April and week six ends the 29th of September. So there's 26 core weeks and you need to walk as many of in as many of those weeks as you possibly can. This year the 1st of April starts on Thursday. So going through the year, each new week of the UK BMS starts on a Thursday. You could start in week minus one, week minus two, and so on, if you've got nice weather. And indeed, tomorrow is in week minus one, and we're set to have good weather tomorrow, so maybe some transects might be walked tomorrow. I'm not sure quite how the uh, extra data before or after the official end, if you get a really good autumn, I'm not quite sure how it's treated, but anyhow, you, you can do those extra walks and submit the data. Now you walk along your transect at a slow, steady pace. And as you go, you identify and count the number of butterflies of each species, usually in within what we call the five meter box. Now that means you only count the ones you see within 2.5 meters to your left, two five meters to your right, or five meters in front of you. So you need to have a good grasp on how big five meters is. Now, it so happens that my study that I'm sitting in now is almost exactly five meters wide. So as I'm walking along a transect, I'm thinking in terms of would that be beyond my study? 
Um, so it probably is quite a good idea to, if you can find something that you're familiar with and that is about five meters, that's something you can bear in mind. If you're not careful, you'll tend to be over enthusiastic and score rather over the five meter boundary. Um, you don't count any butterflies uh, behind you. If you see a butterfly in front of you, um, within the five meters in front of you, and then it flies off like say a peacock often will, and it lands further down the, foot, the path that you're on, don't score it again. But if you lose sight of it, like it moves off to the left and you lose sight of it, and you find fairly quickly a member of that same species, then do not assume it's the same butterfly, count it as another one, okay? Hope that's clear. By the way, I should say that Nick is recording these talks and they will be available for looking at again. I know I'm ripping through it fairly quickly. Um, exceptionally, and this really is exceptionally, you can at set up time decide that you're going to have a wider box like um, ten, a 10 meter box, five meters either side of you, but it would be exceptional. And once you've decided that you have to stick to it. Now, if you've got sections which are along the side of a river, for example, or you've got a wide for, uh, forest verge, um, you only want to count in one direction. So you're counting five meters to one side of you rather than two and a half meters to either side. And again, that needs to be decided at setup time uh, and then it is fixed. One thing you mustn't do is linger at good spots uh, because you know that there's a rare species that you might see there um, or there's an awful lot of butterflies and you want to get a good score. Keep walking at your slow, steady pace. Do not hang about. I'll shortly mention one situation where I think it is actually fair to hang about, but for a totally different reason. As you go within separately within each section, count the butterflies, estimate the percentage sun to the nearest 10%. Now that's the percentage of time in that section when you are casting a shadow on the ground, a distinct shadow on the ground. So if half the time you can see a shadow, then it's 50% so. But do that separately for each section as you go. I might just mention that the new UK BMS website, which I'm going to show you, has easily accessible and really quite self, quite sensible information on health and safety and risk analysis. I know we tend to groan about these things sometimes, but it's quite important. So, for example, on the strengths of common World's End transept, because World's End is really quite isolated, and you, you, once somebody's in there, they can't be seen uh, at all from by other people. Uh, we've sort of had a rule that uh, women do not walk on their own, so they're accompanied perhaps by a dog or a member of their family or maybe another member of the team will just, you know, be somewhere in the clear vicinity to make sure they're okay. And you, I mean, you might well say, well, a, a woman on her own might be at risk, but a, a sort of an elderly old geezer like me in their mid-70s is probably at risk for different reasons, like slipping on a stile and breaking their leg. Yeah, fair comment, but why wife has walked the transept with me, she knows where I go when I tell her I'm off to do the transept. So if I don't turn up, she knows where to send the search party. So these are things that are worth bearing in mind. Um, now, there are minimum necessary weather conditions in order to do a walk. The walk should be between quarter to 11 and quarter to four. Um, Although at the height of summer in warm weather, uh, you can walk between 10 o'clock and five o'clock if you've got those sorts of conditions. I don't know whether other people have this feeling, but I sometimes feel on hot days in summer that around half past nine to half past 10, say um, 11 o'clock, there's lots of butterflies around. And yet by lunchtime or early afternoon, noon, even though the weather's good, it may even be warmer, there's fewer around. I don't know whether other people feel that, but I often feel that. Now, we have this set of minimum weather conditions. If the temperature is greater than 17 degrees centigrade and it's not raining, then you can walk whether or not the sun is out. But if the temperature is less than 13 degrees centigrade, and or there's a strong wind, Beaufort 5 or worse, I'll show you what that means on the next slide, then you don't walk, okay? Either the temperature's too low 
or it's too windy or it's both, then you don't walk. And in between, if the temperature is between 13 and 17 degrees and at least 60% sun, in other words, casting a shadow on average, and it's not raining, then you can walk. Now, this is pretty rule of thumb, isn't it? And I must say that if the temperature were, say, 16 degrees and there was 100% sun and no wind at all, I would be tempted to do the walk, playing one criterion off against the other. The other thing was that on the old website that's just been replaced, there was similar information in different places, as I already mentioned. And there was another place where it said you could only walk, or you could walk if the temperature was greater than or equal to 17 degrees centigrade. Whereas now, the only thing I can see is if it's greater than 17 degrees centigrade. Now, the temperatures, we tend to walk, work to the nearest degree. So that's basically saying you need 18 degrees in order to walk. Uh, unless you've got uh, a reasonable amount of sunshine as well. Now, there's an extra condition that in northern upland areas, if butterflies are active, you can record down, walk and record down to 11 degrees centigrade. As I've just mentioned, percentage sun means the percentage of time that a distinct shadow is cast, and you estimate that to the nearest 10% within each section as you go. Um, now, measuring the temperature at the start and end of the walk, it needs to be the shade temperature, and that's actually quite a tricky thing to measure. Um, most people who drive to their transect use the car's temperature gauge as, as a good way of measuring the shade temperature. Uh, you could perhaps take a thermometer and when you get to the start of your walk, stick it on the ground underneath the car. But if that bit of ground has been on in the sunshine until you stuck your car over it, you're going to have to hang around quite a while until the ground's cooled down to give you a shade temperature. I've tried doing things like carrying a thermometer around in my rucksack. Well, my rucksack's blacker and it just gets hotter and hotter inside. I've tried uh, dangling a, a digital thermometer from my belt, but that doesn't work either. So it's quite a tricky thing, but you need to measure the shade temperature at the beginning and end of your walk. Now, should uh, you be walking in marginal weather conditions, and if these criteria drop below the minimum, then you have to stop the walk. So at a time of year, and it can be true in summer, uh, where the weather is a bit marginal, then if you get a, a a day when the conditions are good enough early in the week, grab that opportunity as you can, because if, if you have to bought the walk, you might have a second chance on a day later in that week. Um, now, I said um, uh, you're not allowed to linger in the hope of seeing butterflies in good sections and so on. Um, one thing I've done occasionally is if the conditions are, are really quite marginal and it's being difficult getting up to an average of 60% sun, and I look up at the sky and I see there's a nice blue patch that's going to appear in, say, 10 minutes, 15 minutes or something like that, I will have a cup of tea and wait for the weather to improve and then walk on again. Now, you're not biasing in any way, you're just meeting the minimum condition. So I think that is acceptable. Um, OK. Um, this is the Beaufort wind scale, zero calm um, going up to uh, when it's five. I think you'd actually feel you wouldn't really be wanting to walk looking for butterflies. And when it gets up to six, you're not allowed to walk uh, a transect. Um, this is actually included on the UK BMS scoring form, uh, so you don't need to commit it to memory. How and what to record? You need to record um, the, as I've said, the time of your start and the shade temperature at the start, the numbers of each species in each section as you go, the percentage sun to the nearest 10% within each section. When you finish, you need to uh, measure, uh, uh, score the time that you finish and the shade temperature at the finish. Now, if for any reason you have to take a break and you're not walking and recording, like you're waiting for uh, a patch of blue sky to come over, as I've just been talking about, or if you're um, a rabid photographer and you've just seen something that you must catch, so you spend 10 minutes chasing a butterfly, what you should do is give 
your time of start and the actual time of finish, not allowing for the gap. So your real time of finish, because it needs to be before quarter to four when you finish. Uh, and then there's a, a place where you can make comments for each walk and what you could easily say was walk was broken, uh, a section so-and-so for 15 minutes whilst doing photography. It's the best way to handle that. Uh, you need to estimate the wind speed. Um, now there's only one box for wind speed, um, which is sort of like the average wind speed over your walk. Now some transects have very different habitats, like at Strensel Common we've got open heathland, and the rest of the transect is in quite enclosed uh, wooded areas. So you can have wind speed of about three on the common, but zero in the other section. So what I normally do is do a separate estimate for each section and, and do an average. Um, you can record butterflies as you go along that are outside the transect scoring box, but you must note those separately and submit them as casual records to the relevant vice county recorder, just as you would with other casual records. You mustn't submit those to the UK BMS scheme. And in general, we've got to be really, really careful that we don't do what is called double counting. That is the same butterfly being recorded through more than one route. So you need to be very careful about that. I, I actually use a field notebook and if I want to score something else, it could be a moth or it could be a slug or a snail, um, anything that isn't uh, a butterfly in the five meter box, it quite clearly goes in square back brackets in my field notebook. I'd like to talk a little bit about team recording now. Um, some people bought their own transect on their own, um, but it is very important to use as many of the 26 weeks as possible aligned for weather conditions. And if you've only got one person who might want a holiday perhaps, or may have other commitments, it can be quite difficult to achieve that. So there's quite a number of transects now, uh, which are recorded by teams. And I think that's a really good idea, actually. Um, UK BMS used to be a little bit sort of, you felt they didn't really quite approve of it, but they seem to be doing more so now. But obviously everyone who's part of the team must be fully confident at identification and they must know the exact transect route and the junctions between the sections. So you can take them around with practice non-recording walks if you want. And I've said you need to write out a, a, an exact description of the route that can help give a, them a copy of that. Now, if you've got two people walking, for example, if you're training a new recorder, then you're walking in pairs, but one person must be acting as the true recorder for the scheme and the other should stay just a little bit behind. So they're not going to interfere with the line of sight of the recorder. They're not going to disturb butterflies before the recorder sees them by walking a bit in front. And you don't want to have a situation where four eyes are better than two. And you don't want to um, distract the recorder by discussing what you're going out for dinner that night when really they're supposed to be concentrating on looking for the butterflies. Um, so that's something to bear in mind. One person, there's more than one person walking at the same time. One person must be assigned the activity recording. The others should not uh, interfere with their behavior as recorder. I know of uh, Three Hugs Wood Meadow um, at the height of summer, there's an awful lot of butterflies. You can have lots of skippers of both types and you can have uh, ringlets and meadow browns and all in good numbers plus other things as well. And what they sometimes do is they have two people. One person is the recorder, the spotter, who shouts out what they're seeing. The other person is the scribe who's writing it down. Otherwise you'll be, it's, can be quite difficult you know there's lots and lots of stuff to see to be writing it down as well as keeping your eyes open now what's needed with a team is you have to keep in very good contact with one another you can use email whatsapp phone uh, phone uh, text messages um, about who's going to be available in the coming week look at the weather forecast who could do the walk who can do it on certain days try to sort of agree um, who, who could do it and if they can't something goes wrong then you've got somebody to back up on the same or maybe another day 
Another thing you need to keep uh, in mind that is if, if you are a team, some people may have less availability than others, like they may have a job and may only be able to do it at the weekend. So do bear that in mind and step back um, where it's possible to do so to enable them you know, perhaps to do a walk at the weekend so that they get their fair turn. And another thing a team ought to do is once somebody uh, has done, successfully done the walk for that week, uh, then they should let the other members of the team know that yes, the walk has been done and it's a good idea to actually share the results as well. And I think at Three Hags Wood Meadow, what they do is they take a photograph of the score sheet and send that out by email attachment to the other members of the team. It's just a matter of letting people know they don't need to worry anymore about what's happening that week. And also it's good for the team spirit to just keep well in touch with one another and keep and let everybody know how things are, are going. Now then, how and what to record? Now, the UK BMS strongly recommend that you use in the field, their, they have a standard recording form F2, and it's on the website, and I'll show you in a minute how you can actually get it. I'm going to be going live uh, onto the internet in a minute, and I feel a bit anxious about that. So, <laughs> so the actual um, talk is also available um, as, um, PowerPoint should we hit problems. Um, so I'll do this in a minute. I'll show you how to get the weekly recorder form. Uh, one thing um, a team needs to decide is, is each member of the team going to submit their own data after they have done a walk or are they all going to pass their results over to some, some boss member of the team who will submit the data for them? And I think the general feeling is it is far better for the team to submit their own data okay uh, what you should do is keep carefully the original hard copy in case of any later queries which could be maybe in the following winter when the people at butterfly conservation headquarters start looking at the actual data and analyzing it and so on now if you use a field notebook, well, just hope you don't lose it. That is where your uh, hard copy data is. But if you use the official form, then just hang on to them uh, for the rest of the year, at least. Be of course, very careful of any transcription errors. Um, and I'll show you how, the, how you enter your data shortly. And again, always be careful about not double counting. Right. There, um, it might not be too easy to see there, but just to show you, this is a copy of the official recording form filled in by me on the 18th of June in 2017, which was week number 12. Um, it's a Strensel Common World's End transect, started at 13.45, finished at 15.05. Average temp average of start and finish temperature was 29. It's a nice day, hot day. There was a wind coming from the northwest, but it was very mild. I said uh, average wind speed one on the Beaufort scale. That's where you're getting very small letters, the definitions of the Beaufort scale. Um, in some sections, it was still. Uh, in other sections, there was a, a small breeze. And I sort of elaborated on that down in the notes down there. So what you do is, well, you could probably, if not all that many butterflies around, you could probably do tally counting, one, bum, 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 slash. Uh, in groups of five uh, within each bit of the score sheet. Sometimes that, that won't be possible. You have to have another paper, piece of paper on which you tot up your ringlets and meadow browns and so on, and then feed the number into the score sheet. So again, be careful of transcription errors. So fill up the sheet. Um, down here, we have the total across the season for each species. Along the bottom, we have the number of butterflies uh, of all the different species seen in each section, sections one to nine in this case, add up the numbers across the bottom, add up the numbers down the right hand side, 35, it should be the same for both directions. If it isn't, you've got a mistake somewhere, okay? Um, remember, you have to enter percentage sunshine as you go. Um, so it's, no cloud at all on that day, so it was 100% in each section, so therefore the average was 100%. 
if say there were two sections in there with only 50%, you'd have to work out the average. I think it's probably about 89% and put that in that box. Okay, so that's what the official uh, score sheet looks like. Now, how are you going to submit your data? Well, when you're setting up a new transect, that needs to be loaded into the system by Butterfly Conservation uh, before you can actually start submitting data. And each walker who's going to be walking that transect uh, needs to be registered with the system, have a, a login and password, and they need to have their name linked to each of the transects that they're going to be walking. Now, I'm going to get online, fingers crossed. So what I need to do is escape from that and go here. Uh, Oh, Zoom, why do you always have to mess things up? Um, I want to up, up, left. Get rid of, up left. There it is, look. Oh, thank you. Right, there we are. Thank you, Nick. We had that problem before, didn't we? <laughs> um, right, OK. So Google, uh, UK BMS, um, and uh, that will get you to the welcome screen. And... Uh, there we are, we're really live on the internet, home, click on my data, and this is what you get. So you can log in there, okay, it says click here to log in. If you're registering a new account, uh, you click there to do that, you'll probably um, be consulting with Nick about doing this, or if he might even offer to do it for you, because it can be a bit tricky. Um, and I'll show you down here. If you click there, you get the latest guidance on how to use the data entry system and the website. And it's a PDF. It's very good. Um, and you can have it on the, another device open whilst you're using the website, or you can download it and print it out as it's a PDF. It uh, really is very helpful. Right. So what I will do now is show you how to obtain um, the official recording form and other information. You can click on get involved. You don't need to be logged in to go to this part of the uh, website. Click there and go down, go down to guidance and recording forms. Okay. Um, it's working quite fast at the moment. Sometimes it can be a little bit slow. You have to be patient. So there's the health and safety stuff, um, Pollard walks, various um, forms and guidance on registering a new transect, but the weekly recording form is there. And there it is in all its glory. So you can download that and print it out. Right, um, and I've just shown you an example of one of mine that I'd filled in. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is show you how to go about actually entering data after you've walked the transect. Those of you who are already familiar with the old version of this website will really welcome the new version, which is much easier to use. What you need to do is click on My Data. There's a lot more things than what I'm going to show you, but I'm just showing you the key things in this talk. My data, go down to walks, and you need to be logged in in order to do this. Down to walks, move to the right, and click on my walks. Um, now, it was a little bit slow. At the height of the season, um, it, particularly in the evenings, or perhaps at the end of the season when everybody's trying to catch up with putting their data in, um, It'll be very slow. You'll get a little message down here, say, waiting for UK EMS. So here we have... Um, uh, um, oh, the year 2021. Somebody's uh, done a, a week minus one transect. It's transit today. Never mind. Um, you have to... It'll be already loaded. Um, uh, saying transect there, or if you're doing wider countryside butterfly survey, it'll say the equivalent there. Um, you need to filter by 
your sites if you're working on more than one. So I'm registered for both of those. So I'll go to Strengths of Common and World's End. It says, okay, wait for it. There we are, it's gone. So what I'm going to do now, I'm, I'm going to actually put in some pretend data. So let's say that I walked this transect on the 26th of March, that's Friday last week. Now, <laughs> tomorrow and subsequent days, you won't be able to access, but days that have already happened, you can click on that green button. Wait, okay, it's done it quite quickly. You have to be patient. Uh, it can take a while sometimes to load up. Um, and it's already got my name in there because I'm registered with the Strensel Common um, site and I've logged in. Now it's got the date because I clicked on that date. So let's uh, fill it out now. Start time. 1400, um, end time, you use 24 hour clock, um, let's say 1530, the colon is in there automatically. Um, percent sun, I'm not going to put that in just yet. Um, the average temperature, let's say it was, see you get only whole degree options, let's say it was 21. Uh, wind speed, uh, average wind speed across the transect. Again, you just have to go for one of the options. So let's say three. And if I wanted to say it was zero in some or wind you and others, I can put any extra information about anything under notes. Um, right, I'm to go on to the next screen, you click on next. I purposely haven't filled that in because I want to see what happens in a minute. I should have done, but I haven't. Um, right, so going now to the recording screen. Wait, it's saying waiting for UK BMS down at the bottom left of my screen. So it just, it's being, this is not slow as this website goes, I can tell you. you at high to summer, you go in to put data in nine o'clock in the evening and you'll be waiting. Right. Um, so what you've got now is the actual recording form in digital. Um, fashion. Um, it is possible if you want to, to order to, to record other things like moths, dragonflies or even I don't know what else, but let's stick to, to butterflies. Now you can choose what sort of list of species. You can have all the species, the common species possibly uh, in Yorkshire. Best is probably those already recorded on this transect. So I'll click on that. Uh, I think I've done that before, so it's remembered that. Anything in pink with this uh, triangle is something you don't expect to get at this time of year. It's a, it's a bit rough and ready, actually, because it seems to be happy with a large skipper. You wouldn't expect to get a large skipper this time of year. So, OK. And then what you do is just section by section, uh, enter the numbers that you've seen. So we might well see a brimstone. OK, so go one. Uh, what else did we see in section one? Let's say we could see a green vein, right? Let's have a couple of those. And then we saw nothing now. It is early in the year until section six, where we saw two brimstones having a nice time together. And what else might we see? Oh, yes, yeah, small tortoise shells. Let's say there were three there near a patch of nettles. Okay. So you see it's filling in the totals for each species as, oh, uh, if I haven't finished this last one yet, you need to um, do a return. There we are. So you've got the totals for each species down the right hand side, the totals for each section across the bottom. This has been done by the computer, so you don't need to bother counting to make sure it's correct. It jolly well should be correct. If you've entered everything and you're happy with it, then click the green box uh, and that's going to start taking you back out again. Um, if you want to go back and change something in the visit details, which I want to check on now, go back to those. Ah, oh, it has not put in the sun. Uh, I don't think I put that in, did I, in my score sheet? So I've got to go back to that and I've got to put in the sun, percentage sun now in each section. There we go. So that goes in at the bottom. I think, no, it does go in the top. 
Yes, there we are. So let's say jolly good to begin with. Uh, well, oh, no, no. It's all like binary, isn't it? Um, okay. Oh, dear. Yeah, you have to go to another square and click on it. Now, I'm very interested to see whether it works this out for me or not. Now we have some bad conditions at the end, suppose. To click somewhere else to finish it off. Okay, right, okay. So let's go back to the details of the visit. Waiting, oh, here we go. Uh, and it hasn't, so you need to calculate that for yourself and fill it in. And I was interested because I have queried today with UK BMS that if, for example, you didn't put in uh, the start time, um, or let's say uh, the wind speed. Uh, uh, oh dear, I want to get rid of one of these, looks like I can't. Um, Oh, yes, let's do this. Yeah, okay. So you forgot to do that. And then I think when you try to move to the scoring sheet. Oh, no. you, you cancelled. No, oh, never mind. There's a funny thing in that if you don't fill in one of the things with the red dot, it'll tell you that you haven't fin that you haven't filled in the percent sum. Um, it doesn't tell you the one that you haven't filled in. Okay, it seemed a bit strange. Don't worry about that. I just I, I had a reply from UK BMS today, and I, it didn't seem to make much sense to me. So I was just interested to see what might happen. But what I am going to do now, I hope that's sufficient illustration of how the system works. Uh, what I'll do is um, I will delete it. Oh dear. Cancel. Uh, cancel. It said leave site. Changes are made may not. I don't want to leave the site. Um, Press cancel at the top and then cancel um, the yellow cancel down below. Uh, do you mean there? Yeah. Press that one. Right. And then press cancel down here and you cancel everything that you've put in. Okay. So leave. Press leave and it's all gone. I was worried that that was part of Zoom. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I think, um, oh, yes, there's just one more thing I want to show you because this you'll find interesting. Again, you've got to be logged in to do this. But if you go in to um, annual summary, which you get to from my data uh, to reporting, click on annual summary. Right. Um, now, you can choose the year, any year you want, back to 1976. So let's go back to last year. You can filter, uh, so you want to look at just your data in that year, or you can combine data for all recorders. Um, and if you go to here, combine data for your own sites, you have the option, there are my two sites, but you can combine data for all sites, okay? Oops, what happened? Um, Yes, something went wrong there. Oh, it doesn't matter what you pick. Um, combined data for all recorders. Okay. Actually, well, if I click on combined data for all sites, like I did last time, you get everything for the entire scheme, 
every transect throughout the country, but you might be interested in looking at somebody else's transect. So let's go there. Okay. Oh, it says no summary data. No, it wasn't walked that year. It wasn't walked that year. So shall we try again? Uh, I'm, am I okay to have time for time, Nick? Uh, we're running over a bit, so I think it's time to wrap up and do questions. Okay, yeah, well, let's um, just go back. I think, I think I've shown you enough, haven't I? And uh, I'll just go back to the PowerPoint then. There we are. So we've dealt now with how to submit data. Um, I, th this is um, the um, PDF. Um, showing you um, so 10 pages, giving you instructions on how to use the website. It's really very good. So you can print that out and keep that by your side. Um, um, so it's a new version, so get used to it. It's much easier to use than the last one. I've mentioned about it being slow, blah, blah, blah. Um, we've done all that. So you can revisit this talk as it's being recorded. Um, there's lots of things I haven't shown you and I just wanted to finish up by saying um, there's a pot we could possibly have another Zoom session to explore the website further, possibly in a few weeks time when people have actually got some data that they've tried uh, loading in, maybe successfully, maybe not. Um, we could also say a bit more about special features of the Rider Countryside Butterfly Survey, which I haven't really covered in any depth tonight. So you might like to think about that. And that is the end. Thank you very much, Terry. I'm going to open it to questions. I've got one question in the uh, chat box, which is what are time walks? And to give Terry's voice a bit of a rest, I'll answer that. So a, a time walk is actually very handy because you can actually bolt these onto your transect if you ever need to. So say for example there's a, a real nice flowery patch appears close by your uh, transect and you really would like to re record it but of course it's not on your transect therefore you can't. The way to do it is just, just do it as a timed walk. So this is 15 minutes and you do a, a crisscross pattern five meters apart each way until you covered approximately covered the area. That's a timed walk, a uh, very handy feature. Dave Wainwright is, is encouraging its use because it allows you to do lots of things that you couldn't do before. So if you're going out surveying a new site, for example, you do a, a quick uh, 50 minute timed count uh, and record that. When it gets back to UK BMS, then it will be interpreted according to the time of year. So they'll adjust uh, according to the time of year as to what species you would expect and actually generate uh, a useful amount of data from it. You might use it if you're surveying for northern brown algas or small pearl bordered fritillary um, or a number of other species. So a handy thing. Uh, I've used it on occasion when you're looking for the hair streaks, because you're not really allowed to pause when, you, when, when you're looking for hair streaks and actually look at the trees, which would be of interest. So if you know of, uh, I try and look out when I'm doing my transect, I, I get in to know the trees. And there are four or five trees, which are really good for the hair streak species. And, and it's nice just to pause, spend a little time and just watch the top. Uh, and there will be a new um, transect uh, uh, designed specifically for hair streaks coming out this year, which you walk at 6 p.m. in the evening, which is the hair streak time of, of the day. Um, they don't like the heat of the day. They don't like wind. They're quite fussy. Uh, purple hair streaks in particular uh, will congregate early in the evening. And um, it's an excellent time of year time of the day to actually do your transect while you would normally just not see them while you're doing your normal transect. So has anybody got any questions? Um, you can do the unmute and ask either of us any questions. You're very Can welcome. I ask uh, Terry or yourself? Um, 
we're from Brockerdale. We've got Essex Skipper. The only way that we can identify Essex Skipper is to uh, uh, catch it in the net, put it in the pot, and you look at the antennae carefully. Um, can I do that while walking a transect, or have we, has that got to be on the side somehow? That's a really good question. Uh, I do that I, one, Nick. <laughs> yes, go on. Um, I, it, I, I looked back at some of the papers by Ernie Pollard, and he recommends um, just scoring them a small skipper stroke Essex skipper, which might be a bit of a cop out. Um, I think it. Prop, I think you'd probably need to keep walking at a slow steady pace and if in the course of doing that you can score an Essex skipper score it as Essex skipper otherwise um, just score them as Essex stroke small and then after you finish the walk go back take a sample and um, divide up the total number in the ratio of what you get in your smallest sample as is recommended for the whites Mm. Mm. Yes, but it varies in different areas of the. Of course, it does. Of course, course it will. And it wouldn't yeah. make sense. Mm. I, uh, well, I mean, you, it's going to slow you down, isn't it, on your transect? I mean, what you're going to do, say, at the height of the season when you've got loads of these small stroke Essex skippers along your transect, how you're going to how you're going to progress? Um, if you're going to be chasing everyone, you know, say it takes off in front of you and, and you know, and, and you set off 10 metres away and then it flies again, how are you going to deal with it? Well, maybe one of us has to carry on with the, with the transect and the other one um, chases the skipper. Oh, that, would be a, yeah. that would be a possibility and you may well end up with some numbers of small skippers a certain number of known Essex skippers, um, and then a certain, and then a, a number which could have been either. Yeah. And the score sheet allows you to do that. Right. We certainly. Do, but use... do you think that's best, Nick? Because you've got yeah. experience of them, haven't you? Uh, I, my experience but not is. Not on a transect. Well, uh, Bishop Wood has a mixture, and I tend to just uh, stop. Take that time out of the out of the uh, uh, of the walk, and just just stop and investigate. Uh, you know, a handful of skippers, and just try and figure the approximate percentage in that area. Um, but you you must keep your speed. That's the important bit. Two kilometers uh, per hour. So if it's a two kilometer walk, which many of them are, you want to try and keep that to an hour. You do find you slow down when it's really really busy. Um, and you have to be aware of that. You're trying to keep the speed as, as, as steady as you can. Um, so just stopping off uh, to do other things, really, you, you've got to avoid unless you're going to take that time out. What we do with the whites, because, you know, if something white goes flying past you at great speed, which occasionally they do, um, you've got five possibilities as to what that white flashing thing that went past is. It could be a female brimstone, which is white it could be a large white it could be a small white it could be a green vein white of course it could be a female orange tip and you're less left with that dilemma and that dilemma will come shortly in a few weeks time and uh, the advantage of working with pairs is you can send the second person off to investigate and actually figure out what kind of percentages you're getting it also that person can then teach the spotter um, what they're actually seeing so the pair of you work, work together and learn together during those first few weeks that you're learning transverse walking certainly you very quickly learn you know orange tips you've got that black that bl definite black spot in a definite part of the wing um it's, it's pretty easy you got the the wing shape of brimstone uh, and the speed and size um the large white you've got the edge etc now what we also tend to do sometimes is when we when we started this, we actually took a camera with us. So we had uh, Chris who, who would take a few snaps because if they don't land, 
you don't have much of a chance. So you can have a look at the pictures later and try and figure it out. But that learning exercise, those first few weeks of your transect walk are really quite important weeks. And to do it as a pair is actually a big advantage because you can work together. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? That's good. I've got the chat. Chat is empty. I would like to thank everybody and especially thank Terry. Um, it's been a long session. I think we've covered a huge amount of ground, not only to cover identification, but the whole of UK BMS. That's one heck of a of, of an achievement. It's done at a brisk pace, but we have recorded it. So you will be able to look back. And a number of you have asked whether the uh, PowerPoint could be made available. And I can do that. I can pop it on the website. So it's available for your reference. Um, and the, the other question that, that Terry po posed was, uh, will there be a, another session? Well, there could be if there's enough, enough of you. So if you'd like another session, if we can get at least eight people to mail in, then we'll do another session. I suggest probably at that critical learning period for you beginners, say in about maybe a month or four or five weeks time, when you've amassed all those F2 sheets and you're thinking, well, I really ought to enter that data now, try and do it fairly regularly. Um, I must admit, I usually pile up two or three and then pop them in um, and do it as a big session because the website can be a little bit slow. Uh, and that's how I get them in. So please do that and we'll have another session if required. And that will cover data entry in a bit more detail. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you, Terry. Very good. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Go have a cup of coffee now.